I would put music and some audio cues in this intro, but I don't have any. Sorry. Warning, if you have not seen whatever it is that I'm reviewing, this video may contain spoilers of key events. You'll have to consider this before watching the rest of the review. You have been warned. Wank! I think the biggest problem with the anime adaptation of Kantai Collection, aka Kankola, isn't that it wastes the premise's potential, because it doesn't. To state that it wastes it is to say that it doesn't use it, much like how Infinite Stratos features a female-dominated world, but instead of using it to explore the social complexities and values of expected gender roles in a world where women are the most privileged thanks to technological superiority, it instead uses it to make a shitty romantic comedy harem. No, Kankola does use the concepts at its disposal. It just doesn't use a whole lot of it. It uses the minimum. Enough to say that it doesn't waste all of the genuinely interesting ideas it has in store, but not enough to create a compelling world or a multi-dimensional plot that could have blossomed if only it took more risks. It's a disappointing outcome, but realizing that the director was Kezo Kusakawa, a man who isn't a stranger to my channel seeing as how he also directed subpar efforts such as the previously reviewed Dog Days and Daybreak Illusion, I'm not particularly surprised either. And though it has moments of chemistry, personality, personality, and is supported by a surprisingly versatile cast of voice actresses, the effort doesn't completely sink, but is unable to properly float. Kantai Collection sports probably one of the most unique premises I have ever encountered despite its inherent simplicity. Humanity is threatened by mysterious and borderline alien-looking ships known as Abyssals, who control our seas with their weaponry and seem to have our backs toward the wall. In retaliation, we have beings called Fleet Girls, anthropomorphic Japanese World War II warships who are tasked with defeating this dangerous foe, and just like that, I was on board with this idea! It's an interesting setup that displayed so many possibilities for making one hell of a fantastical war story. I mean, they're goddamn ship girls! Legit ship girls! Who have these weapons and special abilities with distinct personalities and it could have made for something engrossing, assuming the world building and character development was there to suck me in. If only the story was on the same page. You can't be serious! You're both girls! Girls can't love girls! Girls can't love girls! Girls can't love girls! Uh, hey, wait! You forgot your bed! Instead, we get Fubuki, a destroyer who isn't sure of herself. She's young, inexperienced, and not very strong, but has potential to be better and goes to this naval base where she'll meet other ships like Mutsuki, Yudachi, Akagi, Nakato, and a bunch of other supporting characters and train to become stronger and more confident so she can fight the Abyssals better and if you've come across this story before, that's because Konkola plays this perfectly straight. Maybe a little too straight. I'll say this much, Konkola wasn't unlikable to watch. Actually, I'd say the anime has plenty of upbeat and energizing personality at its core, which made for plenty of character moments that were actually quite a bit of fun to witness. There's a level of entertaining chemistry with almost every dynamic the show put forward, from the charmingly naive antics of Akatsuki, Hibiki, Inazuma, and Ikazuchi, to the gradually developing relationship dynamic that Nagato and Mutsu share whenever they are both given screen time. It helps that Konkola feature some of the most flexible voice acting I've heard in an anime. If you were to tell me that Nagato, Mutsu, Naka, Jinsu, Sendai, Shimakaze, Tama, and Kuma were all voiced by a single actress, I would not have known unless you told me. Whether it's voicing a couple or several ships, each actress gave their respective roles enough differences to generate distinctions in both voice and speech mannerisms. So from the surface characterizations to the voice performances of the all-female cast, Konkola has no shortage of personality. This is good in that the characters aren't ever truly boring, but that doesn't necessarily translate into actual depth, and the fact that it has to juggle this number of different characters does not help. All the tropes are here. You've got the mild but idealistic protagonist who wants to become stronger, the shy but optimistic girl with the high-pitched voice, the girl with the eccentric speech trademark, the mentor figure, the tough leader chick who might actually have a soft spot for cute things, the gang is ready, and they are played mostly without subversion. Sure, you'll encounter the occasional twist or bit of insight into who these characters are, notably Akagi's past trauma of failure or Yamato's weight issue, but for the most part, if you put a bunch of characters in a room who might not like each other very much, chances are they'll find a way to get along. If there is a battle in progress, chances are that the characters will find a way to pull through. And though there is drama to spice up these proceedings, they don't pack as much range as you'd 
think, and mostly boil down to a character not being strong enough or having doubts that are shortly disproven. And even when it deviates from this formula, like dealing with the supposed death of a friend, it doesn't affect the plot in the long term. In fact, it's rare for Concola to go the extra mile to provoke a sense of doubt, which I could be fine with. I'm not asking for the anime to be grim. If anything, making this show needlessly grim would be out of place. But within a 12 episode span, it doesn't help things when halfway through, the show gives us full on filler. Yes, Concola has probably one of the most blatant examples of filler within an anime I have ever watched that isn't even 20 plus episodes. Why did we need this curry cook off? Oh yeah, because this property is popular, the characters are popular, and we need to show off how much personality they have. Without much drama with long term impact or character development with thematic payoff, it seriously tried my patience, and the aforementioned filler did not help by pausing the plot progression like it did, even for a single episode. The weight wasn't there, and the effect of the show's action scenes were cut down as a result. It's a bit of a shame, too. I actually like how the show looks. It definitely holds the World War II inspiration to a sizable regard, and if it were attached to further world building, it would have made for more than something to look at. Especially when it provides moments where the framing, lighting, and coloring are just right, and creates some of the show's best visual highlights. Hell, I even disagree with the CG looking bad. It blends in with the art design in a somewhat seamless fashion, and though it can look somewhat off half the time, for the most part, there wasn't a whole lot that really stuck out enough to look bad to me. Not to mention that the musical score is so damn good, varied, and powerful. If there's anything Concola does waste, it's the music on offer here. My god, I haven't listened to music this mismatched since Infinite Stratos. I definitely recommend listening to it. But even if the sound and visual presentation aren't slouches per se, it doesn't help that the previously stated issues are ultimately detriments to the above average effort that was put into the show, both in or out of battle. The tension and drama that would otherwise be there was trapped in a limbo, not being able to surface towards the sun. Then I realized that all of these cons were actually symptoms of a much larger gripe. I've never played the game this is based on, but from what I can tell, it doesn't look to have much of a story or lore to begin with. And though it'd be easy to label this as a red flag, I think this can be a good thing. Because the narrative doesn't have much ties to any pre-established story or lore, that means they could have made their own interpretation through sheer creativity. If there isn't much of a story or lore to worry about, take the elements you can get and go nuts when creating them. If it can work for Shingeki no Bahamut, who's to say it can't work for any other game that doesn't have much of a story to begin with? Concola could have met the same fate. A dedicated anime narrative that could flesh out the characters and world so you don't have to do so in the game itself. But that vision doesn't materialize much. It isn't even attempted to a meaningful degree. For how much freedom Concola must have had to elaborate on its potentially engrossing world, it doesn't do a whole lot to establish a fully functioning and informative lore to its setting, and though it implies a bigger world with still unforeseen revelations, I think that encapsulates the problem in a nutshell. Where did the Abyssals come from? What is their motivation? Where did the Fleet Girls come from? Have they always been there? Are they people who've been given spirits of Japanese warships, or are they warships? ships that have been transformed into people? Are they born like humans, or are they created like machines? What kind of world is this away from the oceans? How do fleet girls affect our understanding of what it means to be human? The anime doesn't really answer these questions. It implies answers, but never truly confirms actual pieces of world building lore. It's made even more jarring when the show implements one of the game's mechanics, like this instant repair bucket. Why is it there? Well, it's from the game, so it has to be there. I think. And then there's stuff that just feels misguided, like the fact that we never see the Admiral. I get it, the Admiral is supposed to be some sort of abstract figure representing the viewer, hence why the characters sometimes look at the camera and act as if they are interacting towards us. Except. This is an anime. It would be understandable if this was the game, since you are the ones who are in command of these characters, but the way they frame such a role in the anime comes off as being an awkward directing choice. I'm not the Admiral. I'm sitting in my chair, witnessing characters talking to someone who doesn't even visually appear. What I'm getting at is that instead of using the elements from the game to craft an engrossing war story about these different anthropomorphic ships fighting this mysterious enemy, it uses an overly simplistic story to justify using the elements 
components from the game in anime form. As a result, it makes for an experience that feels less like a fleshed out adaptation and more like a fully animated and voice acted let's play of its source material. It's a bare bones method of adaptation, one that probably sticks to its roots pretty closely, which is good for those expecting a very faithful anime recreation of the game's setting, mechanics, and logic, but not so much for those expecting a decent, well-told story within such a unique world. Concola yearned to be explored, and I yearned to experience whatever it wanted to explore, but that never happened to a satisfying extent. Again, I've never played the game, but because I've never played the game, that only means I wanted to be hooked into its universe through this anime, to be invested in something that goes beyond just ship battles. As it stands, however, I only managed to receive a taste of that potential. I was drawn into Concola's setup, and I still am after watching this anime. I just wasn't hooked with the end result. Look, I had some fun with Concola. Seriously, I really did have some fun watching it. The characters can be quite the entertainers, and I wouldn't be surprised if you actually found a favorite among them if you haven't already. I sure did. My favorite ship is Akagi, don't judge. But when you take those out, what you're left with is an adaptation that's harmless to watch, not to mention easy to watch, and maybe a little too faithful to the game to strike some interesting ideas and might not otherwise be able to. After all, a game is a game, but an anime is an anime, and animes usually dedicate themselves to having a story more than games do. Usually, not always. Out of all the shows Kezo Kusakawa has directed that I've reviewed, this one is easily the best, most enjoyable directorial effort. But that isn't saying a whole lot when taking into account how bad both Dog Days and Daybreak Illusion were to me. If you're a fan of the Kantai Collection web game, you might enjoy this a good deal. A lot of the ships are here, and there might be more in the sequel that was announced at the end of the finale. But for those like me, with an outside perspective and a curiosity for this intriguing premise, you might be let down if you fail to moderate your expectations. Oi. Wait, wait, wait.